even the greatest imperial powers in history cannot expand forever, and are eventually forced to come to terms with consolidation and defense in order to maintain their realm. The emperors of Rome adapted to this state of affairs by stationing their mighty legions on the dangerous frontiers and around the more important regions which they ruled. Legions which were often stationed in legionary fortresses. Welcome to our video on imperial legionary fortifications, how they were constructed and what life was like for the troops stationed therein. A big thank you to one of our longtime partners, Magellan TV. If you haven't looked into Magellan yet, you're missing out on an amazing library of documentaries. Magellan is a new type of documentary streaming membership founded by filmmakers, their team of producers and curators that bring together premium content with well-researched detail. With a subscription to Magellan TV, you have access to feature genres of history, science, space and nature, as well as individual documentary movies and series. Magellan also has different specific history playlists, like ancient history, current history and military history. We've recently been watching Hidden History of Rome, which dives into the question of what have the Romans ever done for us, and explores all of their accomplishments in the ancient world. You can stream Magellan from anywhere on any device, without any ads and no limited access. Many new programs are added on a weekly basis, and a wide selection are available in 4K. We highly recommend you check out Magellan TV and go to our link magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals to get a special offer of a one month free trial. Like so many other things in the Roman Empire, the concept of a legionary fortress came into being during the reign of Emperor Augustus, the founder of Rome's imperial period. Before this much needed era of reformation after the turmoil of the late Republic, legions had traditionally been raised for specific military ventures, and were then disbanded after this purpose was complete. Provinces such as Spain always required a resident army wintering there, due to the fact that the far-off Roman territories were too far from the heartland to constantly shift men back and forth. This was also the case with expansive and lengthy military campaigns, such as Caesar's conquest of Gaul, which necessitated the quartering of legions within the occupied lands. However, it is only from the time of Augustus onwards that we discover standing armies billeted in permanent quarters in the empire's various far-flung provinces, from northern Britain to the distant reaches of Egypt. The first true fortress isn't known, but we do know that during the expeditions across the Rhine into Germany during the final years of the first century BC, Fortresses were constructed in enemy territory in order to hold parts of this wild landscape. This didn't last long, however, and the subsequent disaster at the Teutoburg Forest led to the Roman military abandoning these fortresses across the Rhine. Whatever the case, we can speculate that Roman military leaders took these prototype fortresses and merged them with legionary practices from centuries gone by in order to implement the new defences. Each legion was probably responsible for the construction of its own home fortress, and could call upon a number of specialists from its own ranks. This probably included architects, engineers, surveyors, plumbers, roofers, carpenters, stonemasons, and so on. As well as providing skilled experts, the legion in question would also provide the raw manpower necessary for clearing the chosen building site of unwanted detritus and for actually building the fortress. All of this makeshift construction force would be supervised by the legion's Praefectus Castrorum, the prefect of the camp, who was an experienced officer promoted after extensive service as a centurion. While this process led to a relatively standardized fortification design, and it is clear that there was at least a basic blueprint, no two were totally identical. Most fortresses, for example, were based on a rectangular perimeter of 20 to 25 hectares. However, there were outliers. For example, two German legions during the late 1st century AD differed in that one of them was based in an abnormally small fortress of 16.5 hectares at Nijmegen, while the other legion had an abnormally large 27 hectare fort at Bonn. Every fortress had four gateways, one for each of its four sides. The front gate, also known as the Porta Praetoria, and the rear gate, known as the Porta Decumana, 
were both halfway along the rectangle's short sides. The longer sides of the fortress were different, with each of the gates on these edges, known as the Porte Principales, being constructed a third of the way down the length. These side gates were known by this name because they were both connected by the same laterally running road within the fortress itself, which passed in front of the Principia, the function of which we shall discuss in detail a bit later. For now it's enough to say that the Principia was centrally placed, interrupting the main road running lengthways and splitting it into two sections. The part running from the front gate to the Principia was known as the Wea Pretoria and terminated at the Wea Principales, while the rear length, the Wea Decumana, began with the Wea Quintana, a road running behind the Principia. These weren't the traditional Roman roads that we know on the Italian peninsula, and were typically 7 to 8 meters wide, constructed with gravel over a bed of cobbles. It was tilted slightly outwards, with stone-built side drains, so that any accumulating water would flow off and into the drain, rather than pooling on the road itself. Normally, the road builders would also add a sewer underneath, in order to more effectively carry waste away from the fortress, making disease less likely among the troops. The final road ran around the internal perimeter of the fortress behind its defences, called the Via Segularis, and was constructed to facilitate the speedy mustering of troops. The crisscrossing road system essentially divided the fortress into five zones, two zones at the front and back, known as the Pretentura and Retentura respectively, each of which comprised a left and right zone, bisected by the structure's roads. This left a singular remaining zone, sandwiched between the Via Principalis and the Via Quintana, known as the Latera Praetorii, or flanks of the Praetorium, known as such because the buildings here were arranged around the Praetorium, the commander's residence. The Roman tendency to standardize even extended to the size of each area, as we can see from archaeological digs performed on Roman fortresses across Europe. In most fortresses, the central zone was two blocks, or as the Romans called them, scamna, deep, with one fronting onto the Via Principalis, while the second faced the other way, onto the Via Quintana. The Retentura was only one block deep in order to accommodate the lodgings of four cohorts, two on either side of the Via Decumana, while the Pretentura was two or three deep. Now we'll discuss some of the key buildings and features of each Roman fortress, examining how they impacted the lives of everyday soldiers and their commanders alike. We will start with the legion's headquarters, the aforementioned Principia. This command building occupied a central position in each legionary base and was modelled after the famous Roman Forum, which existed in most towns of the imperial period. A Principia was entered through a monumental gate-like structure known as a Groma, due to the fact it was also the position of the reference point for a legion's surveyors. Inside the gate was an open colonnaded courtyard surrounded by yet another drain, which collected rainwater from the thatched rooftops around it, much like those on the roads. Moreover, the runoff water was often fed into a storage system, such as the one at Inchtothil in Scotland, which had a capacity of somewhere around 47,500 litres. On three sides of the courtyard were rows of rooms, long thought to have served as armories and other storage chambers, while the fourth side was occupied by a long hall known as a basilica. This was a place of assembly for the troops, with a tribunal at one end, and sometimes even at both ends. Its name would come to denote types of church in later eras. Behind the basilica was a series of offices which flanked the central legionary shrine, where the revered Aquila was kept, the eagle standard, in addition to 59 centurial standards, Signa. It's clear that this building was an administrative and financial centre for the legion, and we can see this in multiple examples we have found inside excavated Principia. Standard bearers of the Roman army often had financial responsibilities, so in many of the fortresses the floor of its central shrine was elevated in order to create a strong room in the basement. Here, the legion's official funds were kept, in addition to the savings of individual soldiers. It was essentially an ancient safe vault. 
various clerks and other administrators necessary to keep the legionary cogs turning probably occupied the other offices, possessing various documents, organizing logistics, and other routine tasks. One room at Lembasis in modern Algeria contained an inscription confirming the excavated room as a tabularium legionis, or records office of the legion. On the inscription was a list of staff, including an adjutant, a registrar, and several lower secretaries. In addition to its mundane, bureaucratic function, it's clear that this building also had religious overtones, which is shown by the frequent excavations of altars at the old sites of these fortresses. All evidence brings us to the conclusion that the Principia was therefore the main hub of the legion, its religious center and its administrative nexus, where its official records were kept and where its funds were dispersed. Moreover, it was often the actual physical center of the entire legion, where a commanding officer could assemble the troops for an address. Said commander had levels of accommodation which were very different from the massed barrack blocks of the soldiers. This was known as the Praetorium, located behind or beside the Principia. As this was normally the dwelling of a lofty senator of the Roman aristocracy, or a commander appointed directly by the emperor, the Praetorium followed the plan of a high-class Mediterranean villa, bringing all of the luxuries to which such high-born figures were accustomed to the provinces, which were often far from Rome itself. Because of this, historians often refer to this building colloquially as the Legate's Palace. Aside from living rooms and gardens for use by the commander's family, a praetorium had to possess servants' quarters and public rooms, the latter of which served as an area where a senatorial commander might convene with his officers and entertain distinguished visitors. Perhaps a legate might enhance his relationship with a pro-Roman Celtic chieftain in Britannia by inviting the man to dine and bathe in his home, for example, before discussing business in the Roman manner. Slightly less luxurious but still of a relatively high class were the domos, or tribune's houses, grouped in an area along the Via Principalis and having a dining room, colonnaded courtyard, and other standard Roman Mediterranean designs. Because every fortress was in effect a self-contained military town, containing as many as 6,000 troops, the greater part of its area was taken up by accommodation for the legionaries and their officers. Despite this, however, many other buildings were usually included for utility. Large courtyard structures meant for industrial production have been found at such sites as Exeter and Inchtothil, and at the latter, excavator Sir Ian Richmond found a hoard of a million nails and nine iron tires buried when the fort was abandoned. A similarly sized courtyard in the Retintura at Curlian may have also been one of these industrial workshops, known as a fabrica as it was associated with lead-working waste material. Activities in these facilities were practiced as a side profession by ordinary legionaries with an expertise in specific skills or crafts, legionaries who were known as imines. As skilled workers, these soldiers were often exempt from the back-breaking labor undertaken by their unskilled comrades, such as digging ditches and patrolling the ramparts. Many of these technical crafts were linked to the manufacturing or repair of equipment, and were therefore key in enhancing the operations of a legion as a whole. One papyrus from Egypt confirms the assumption that such activity must have taken place in large workshops, when it refers to work in Fabrican Legionis, or in the legionary workshop. Archaeologists have discovered three main varieties of fabrique, a long rectangular hall, the double hook or U-shaped building, and the bazaar type complex of maze-like interconnected rooms. It is common to find evidence of smithies within legionary fortresses, but they must have had workshops for leatherworking, woodworking, glassmaking, and other trades. Also universal within the legion's own town was the hospital, or valetudinarium, a building which Higinus recommends should be located as far as possible away from the workshops in order to make sure that recovering patients get the peace and quiet they need. However, there was no standard position for a legionary hospital. 
For example, the buildings at Kelian, Vetera, Nove and Loriacum were placed in the Praetentura, while a site in the Latera Praetorii was selected at Inchtothil, Neuss, Carnuntum and Bonn. The building itself always followed the same plan. Two rows of rooms, separated by a corridor, ran around the four sides of an open colonnaded courtyard. Most of the rooms were arranged in pairs of wards flanking a small vestibule, giving access to the corridor. The vestibule gave the wards a degree of privacy from the outside world, while the corridor permitted staff to circulate as needed around the hospital. Even evidence of underfloor heating, known as a hypercost, was found at Kalian, while the hospital at Vetera had small baths and a latrine. Dedications to the health deities Hegeia and Telesphoros were made at shrines in most hospitals, and it has been speculated that the entire hospital was a religious monument of sorts. In a truly Roman fashion, each fortress was provided with a typical hallmark of Roman civilization at that time in history, the thermae, or bathing complex, for the use of the troops. These were built from masonry most of the time, even in the turf and timber fortresses of the early period, almost certainly to reduce the risk of fire spreading from this building's massive furnaces, which were used to heat the water. Using stone would also prevent deterioration from dampness and maintain a constant temperature in the various rooms. Interestingly, while the thermae did not have any designated position in each fortress, they were often placed near the hospital a fact which emphasizes the connection between health and cleanliness even in the classical world. As the largest structure in each fortress, the baths also represented a true feat of Roman engineering and would probably have been considered a wondrous miracle by many of the less technologically advanced barbarian peoples to whom they were first introduced, such as the Britons. At Caleon, the vaulted ceiling of its thermae stood a proud 15 meters above the floor, and the entire bathing complex covered a huge hectare in space. In Roman culture, bathing was not only a matter of getting clean, but also had a recreational and social function, which we will probably discuss in a future video. The excavator at Caleon, George Boone, noted an inscription which concisely shows us a legionary's philosophy when it comes to his free time. To hunt, to bathe, to gamble, to laugh, this is living. In warmer climates such as North Africa and Egypt, outdoor swimming pools and exercise yards were constructed, while in chillier climates such as Gaul or Britannia, indoor exercise halls and swimming pools were necessary, in Chester for example. The layout of the thermae itself were as follows. A changing room, followed by three main halls laid out in sequence beginning with the Frigidarium, or cold room. It was unheated and usually comprised one or more cold water wash basins and plunge pools. A Thermae's second room was the Tepidarium, or warm room, which was moderately heated, while the third was a Caldarium, or hot room, which had a hot water pool. A bather would progress through the pools at increasing temperatures in order to induce a cleansing level of perspiration at which point dirt and grime could be scraped from the oiled body with a bronze tool known as a strigil. Our series on the Roman armies will continue all the way to 1453, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.